Wednesday. Uh, my name is Peter Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. We are looking at NFL power rankings going into the final week of the NFL regular season. Going to look at the Flames game from last night. NHL All-Stars are going to be announced, so I make my picks for each team's representative. Uh, and we will look at uh, another time where Ross Atkins probably would have been better off not talking to the media. Uh, if you want more of my thoughts on all things hockey, I was on Game Over Juniors 24 last night, or yesterday morning, looking at Canada's heartbreaking loss against Czechia. Uh, also, I was on Game Over Calgary last night, looking at the Flames win over the Minnesota Wild. Uh, so if you want a little bit more detail on that one, uh, then you can check out those shows over on SDPN. Uh, as always, find me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm at primetimekline, twitch.tv slash primetimepk, and you can email the show, Couch Potato Diary at yahoo.com. Calm. Uh, I think that's all the plugging I have. Oh, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like the video and subscribe. And if you're listening in podcast form, remember to leave a rating and subscribe there as well. All right. Uh, without any further ado, uh, let's get into NFL power rankings. The penultimate NFL power rankings as we head into the final week of the regular season. Um, they, they, we said before, they've locked this spot in. The worst team in the NFL that doesn't have their first round pick this year. It's the Carolina Panthers. Um, that They have just been so bad this season. And you thought maybe they were figuring some stuff out um, coming off of a game against Green Bay where they actually played pretty well. Um, I think that just more shows that Green Bay's defense is a bit more of an issue than maybe people give it credit for. Because um, like they, they are just, they are so bad. And I think this is going to be a very interesting offseason um, for Carolina. They need to get the offensive line figured out and they need to get um, Bryce Young a couple of weapons to throw to and help help him out a little bit. If that means sacrificing on the defensive side, whatever. You have to find out what you have in this number one overall pick who you gave up so much to go out and get. They, they need to get this situation figured out. ASAP. At 31, it's the New England Patriots. They hung with the uh, the Buffalo Bills. They even beat the Denver Broncos, but th this is still a bad football team. And there's a lot of conversation now around what do you do with Bill Belichick? Um, I would imagine he's probably gone. At the very least, he can't be in charge of uh, player personnel decisions anymore. Like th this is this is an atrocious roster. It's one of the worst rosters in the league, and they are in th they're in a pretty rough spot. I would say right now going forward, um, the defensive side of the ball is okay, but offensively, you don't have the quarterback. You maybe have a running back. You don't have much of an offensive line, and you have zero wide receivers to speak of. It is basically empty out there in New England. And so we'll see, like, that they have a chance, an outside chance, but a chance of getting um, a, a top two pick, which would get them one of the top two quarterbacks in this draft. I wonder if they reach, if they get to the, that third spot on, on Penix Jr., who has been really good in the college football playoff, um, or was really good in the college football playoff, um, or, or if they go with Daniels. But more draft talk to come uh, as the weeks go on, for sure. Um, at 30, it is Arizona. They come up with a big win so uh, against Philadelphia, so maybe they should be a little bit higher on this list. But unlike the, the first two teams that we talked about here, there's actually hope in Arizona. <laughs> um, like, Kyler Murray has shown that he is something. And, like, James Conner is actually pretty good. And this offensive line is actually all right. Uh, we'll, we'll see how much longer James Conner is actually there. But, like, they, they actually have a, a few pieces now that they have started to, um, that, that they've started to build out there in Arizona. So we'll, we'll see. Like, again, they're, they're 30th for a reason, but they've actually started to build something all right out in Arizona. At 29, it's the LA Chargers. Uh, they're going to be looking for a new head coach this offseason. I still think a lot of the pieces there are are something that you can feel confident about, but this is absolutely a lost season for the Chargers. Uh, at 28, it is Washington. Uh, we, we did the quarterback talk a few weeks ago where they, they were one of the teams that, oh, they know who they have at quarterback. Now I'm not so sure. Uh, now, now I think there are some concerns about the quarterback spot out in Washington, but they have a chance uh, at a, a number two pick here in the draft that, that I think would solve a lot of those questions pretty quickly, uh, at least for the time being. At 27, it's the New York Jets. Um, another, like, again, a lot of these teams have been bad for a while, so we've said the same stuff, like that this isn't a good football team, and Aaron Rodgers wouldn't have fixed it, and um, it's... 
I, I think it's going to be a, an, an off, a, a Dululu off season for the New York Jets because I think they're going to talk themselves into, well, if we just had Aaron Rodgers, we would have been blah, 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 blah. Um, and the fact of the matter is Aaron Rodgers wasn't that great in his last season in Green Bay and is going to be playing behind an offensive line that unless you address it is putrid. So they have a lot to figure out next off season for the Jets. At 26, it's the Giants. Um, to Rod Taylor, actually looks relatively good um and he's looked a whole lot better than some of the other quarterbacks we've seen here this upcoming or this past season so we'll see what happens with him coming up in the offseason but yeah it, it's been a rough year for New York football in general at 25 it's the Raiders yes they were only mathematically eliminated a couple of days ago um Antonio Pierce has done an amazing job of getting this team to at least believe again I, I've seen everything from you can't let this guy go to you can't give this guy another contract when it comes to Antonio Pierce taking on the full-time responsibilities of the head coach of the Vegas Raiders. I, I think there's going to be a lot of pointing to Dan Campbell and what he did to just change the culture out in Detroit. I don't know if Antonio Pierce is going to be the coach the next time the Raiders win the Super Bowl, but I, as a Raider fan, I'd like to see him coach this team again next week or next year sorry well next week as well um Atlanta comes in at 24 this is just a brutal football team to watch um and it's been so frustrating to see some of the high-end talent on this team go to waste and now they still have a, a couple of paths to uh, a playoff berth this year which is more a statement on the playoff format than anything else but um th this is such a wasted season like this division should have been theirs long ago out in Atlanta, and now they need a bunch of things to go their way to just have a hope. Uh, at 23, it's Minnesota. I think they've clearly established Nick Mullins is definitely the right choice. Hey, that other dude who you trotted out there on Sunday Night Football, kind of the worst quarterback we've seen this year, so that's probably a good guy to not go to again, especially with, you know, season on the line and whatnot. Um, at 22, it's the Tennessee Titans. They have already started their uh, turn toward next season. This is going to be an inter uh, interesting offseason there and probably the start of a new era. We'll see if Mike Vrabel wants to hang around uh, a rebuild. He seems like the exact coach you would want around a rebuilding team, but I would imagine the team that he used to play for, if they have a coaching vacancy, is going to be throwing a lot of money at Mike Vrabel to, to come be the coach of the New England Patriots. At 21, it's the Chicago Bears. They have a real interesting decision to make because they know they have the number one overall pick uh, because they acquired that from Carolina in that disaster trade for the Panthers a season ago. And Justin Fields has looked like a has looked like a guy. And it, it's it, it's a difficult decision. This isn't Kyler Murray, Josh Rosen. That this could be like 1A, 1B. And I don't know what the right answer is for them right now. Um if they were able to move off of the field's money and bring in a, a young quarterback and build around that way, that's fine. But then, like, you're no further along, aside from, like, you have more money to spend, which obviously would help fill some of those holes. But quarterback is not a need for this team right now. If they could move out of this pick, get just a whack load of picks, and really set themselves up for the future, because I, I just, as, as, as well as they've played the last little bit, this is not a team that is just one piece away. I think they need a few pieces, and they could answer a lot of those with one good draft coming up here if they made the, the right move um, with that number one overall pick. At 20, it is Denver. Um, I have begrudgingly accepted that this isn't as bad of a football team as I thought. Russell Wilson is on his way out at the end of the season, so major questions remain out in Denver. But there's not as many holes to plug as we thought there was. This has been a pretty good turnaround for this Denver Broncos team and an okay year one for Sean Payton, although he did not handle the end of the Russell Wilson era with a whole lot of grace. At 19, it's the Indianapolis Colts. Um, they are still alive in this playoff hunt. Garner Minshew has certainly led the charge on that and has shown that he can be a viable starting quarterback in the National Football League. And I think that this is... Again, a good building season for the for the Indianapolis Colts. I don't know if I want to see them in the playoffs, if I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Like, this isn't a team that excites me all that much uh, out in Indianapolis. At 18, it's the Pittsburgh Steelers. They have unlocked something with Mason Rudolph at the, the quarterback spot, and I don't even think Mason Rudolph is that good. It just shows the incompetence that was playing that position before and was calling plays out in Pittsburgh before. Um, this is a team that, like, you, you really do have to look at 
what happened this season. Uh, a couple of starts with Mitch Trubisky that ha- may end up costing them their season, depending on how this week plays out. But they, they have at least are still set up to be the, the Steelers of old again coming up next season. At 17, it's New Orleans. That was a good win for them this week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in a game they desperately needed to have to keep their playoff hopes alive. And one of the better games Derek Carr has, uh, Derek Carr, sorry, has played as a New Orleans Saint. At 16, it's the Seattle Seahawks. Um, they continue to play a bunch of eh, games. Um, they are not an overly inspiring team, but they are in a pretty good spot to make a, a playoff spot here uh, this upcoming week. The Green Bay Packers, with a good win on Sunday Night Football, put themselves in a win-and-you're-in situation coming up this Sunday. And we, we talked about it on, on yesterday's show. This offense has taken the step that a lot of people, or that at least I thought, they could take. And now they absolutely have to address the defensive side of the football. But th- this is... This has been about as positive a year as you could expect for the Green Bay Packers. At 14, it's the Houston Texans. Um, ditto. No one would have expected this season to go as well for the Houston Texans. They had a number of players step up, and now you can see an actual foundation building with the Houston Texans. Uh, no, we're not at the dog pound yet with Cleveland. We're at uh, their, their state mates, the Cincinnati Bengals, who come in at 13 on our list. Uh, A tough loss against the Kansas City Chiefs hung with them, but I I think you're starting to see some of the cracks in Browning start to to show a little bit. Just like, I mean, yeah, he can't out-duel Patrick Mahomes, so check that box off, I suppose. But um, just a a lost year for the Cincinnati Bengals. At 12, it's Tampa Bay. Yes, they lost to a team that is uh, five spots behind them. I don't care. They're your Tampa Bay Bucks. They're my Tampa Bay Bucks. They are our Tampa Bay Bucks, and they are a win away from cashing our division win ticket uh, that we got at a a lovely, lovely price at the start of the season. So that would be a a real nice boost if we could get that Tampa Bay. We've already hit the over. Let's go get that division title this week. I think Baker Mayfield and company can get it done against the Carolina Panthers. At 11, it is the LA Rams. That was not the statement win I was hoping for um, from this uh, most recent week here with the LA Rams against the, the New York Giants, but this offense is still going to be a problem for anyone who they face. For anyone, that was bad grammar, but you know what I mean. For anyone they face in the NFC wildcard round a couple of weeks from now, this is is a really good offense, and this is a pretty good football team. Um, I think Sean McVay deserves, like, it's going to be Stefanski for what he's done out in Cleveland, but Sean McVay at least deserves to be nominated for Coach of the Year for the job he's done with the LA Rams. At uh, at 10, sorry, it is Jacksonville. They are still battling for top spot in the division. Uh, It all comes down to to this week, so we will see what happens with the health of of Trevor Lawrence. At 9, it's Philadelphia. This was the red flags, fire alarms going off loss against Arizona. You you simply, with a a chance still to be the one seed, a chance still to be uh, the division champions, you cannot have that loss. And we talked before, it's now on leadership. The veteran players, and I think specifically Nick Sirianni, the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, they need to get this back on track. Um, I think there are a lot of people saying that maybe you rest hurts this week. I would not be opposed to that because you're not, you're not going to answer any of the questions you have. You're not answering this week. This needs to, I think Hertz needs a bit of a breather. The, the body needs to rest. Let him just sit in an ice bath for 14 days before the, the NFC wild card game that they're going to play in because Dallas is not losing to Washington. Um, at eight, it is Cleveland. The, the feel good story of the NFL right now, Joe Flacco, what just a day and night situation. You go from Deshaun Watson, like public enemy number one in the NFL, not a good dude, but gets $200 million guaranteed so they can't cut him. The entire like rest of the fan bases around the NFL despise this team for having Deshaun Watson and are so frustrated that they're doing well in spite of the fact that uh, Deshaun Watson is playing like poo-poo. And then he goes down with an injury which was a whole saga unto itself. He goes down with an injury. They call in 38-year-old father of two, Joe Flacco, off of his couch, and he now leads this team to a playoff spot where he can rest this week. It is one of the coolest stories we've seen in sports, and it's just, it's, oh, it's just so much fun. So we hate that the Cleveland Browns employ Deshaun Watson, but we love that the uh, Cleveland Browns are employing Joe Flacco right now. At seven, it's Detroit. I can't get them any higher than that. I I know the team ahead of them just had a real bad loss this week. Can't do it. Um, It's Miami coming in at six. That was a humbling loss and certainly one of those ones where it's like, okay, 
maybe a lot of the, the worries you have about this team are accurate. We will see. This is a monster game for them. We talked about it on Monday. The difference between being the two seed and the five seed for the Miami Dolphins is crucial. They need this win to get at least one game uh, of home field advantage in the AFC playoffs. At five, it's the Dallas Cowboys. They look like they are on their way now to a division crown some way, somehow. It has not always been pretty um, with that that uh, win against the Detroit Lions being a very strange one, um, but win's a win. And we'll, we'll see what they can do now in the postseason. At four, it's Kansas City. That was a win they needed to have against Cincinnati this week. At three, it is the Buffalo Bills. A gigantic matchup. The scenarios could play out where Buffalo could finish second with a win or be eliminated with a loss. They get the, the Sunday night football treatment. We'll be waiting all day for Sunday night for the Bills against the Dolphins. Uh, the, the Dolphins are in. The Bills still can be the two seed or they could be the eight seed and only seven teams make the playoffs. The fact that they are in this spot is quite the turnaround, given how things were going at the beginning of the season. And if they do get in, and they probably will, uh, but if they do get in, th this is one of the hottest teams in the NFL right now. At two, it is the San Francisco 49ers. Get back on track, but not a, a perfect performance by any stretch of the imagination. Hopefully Christian McCaffrey is all right. And at number one, it's the Baltimore Ravens. No other team could be here right now. I, I don't know if on paper they're the most complete team in the National Football League, but they sure as shit are playing like it right now. This has been an incredible last few weeks for uh, former and future MVP Lamar Jackson as this team is poised to get the one seed um, and now poised to make a, a deep run in the postseason. The only question that remains is can Lamar Jackson do this with the lights on bright in January in the playoffs? So those are your NFL power rankings going into the final week of the NFL regular season season. The Calgary Flames uh, won last night. Kind of felt like they lost, but they did win over the Minnesota Wild. Let's talk about it. The Calgary Flames with a 3-1 win over the Minnesota Wild last night at XL Energy Center, I think is what it's still called, out in Minnesota as uh, old Northwest Division rivals faced off in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul for um, what was an interesting game. So coming into this one, you had a Minnesota Wild team that was missing everyone good. Uh, their top goalie, out. Their top goal scorer in Kaprizov, out. They were also missing Zuccarello, and they were also missing Felino. That is a lot to deal with when it comes to injuries, and the Flames treated them as such to start the game. Calgary was doing everything you were supposed to do to win hockey games. They were scoring, which is kind of the big thing, because scoreboard counts. Um, but defensively, they were making it impossible for Minnesota to get out of their own end. They were creating opportunities both on the rush and in to, to steal the basketball term in the half court offense. Um, they, they were doing everything you needed them to. And it was two nothing. And then all of a sudden, um, Osterley makes a bad pinch with all the forwards in deep. And it's a three on one the other way. And Patrick by God Maroon puts the puck in the back of the net and it's two to one. And you're thinking, okay, a blip, but the flames have been controlling this game. That's nothing to worry about. And then Minnesota proceeded to, for the next, like, 27 minutes of that hockey game, kick the tar out of the flames. Calgary could do nothing correct. It was all Minnesota. They had a 16-1 to uh, shot advantage at one point in the third period. They were in complete control of this game, and Jacob Markstrom steps up to hold on. So there's a number of different ways to look at it. The positive is... It is tough to play much better than they played in the first half of that game. They played really, really well. And it's just nice to see them be able to put that on tape. The bad part is, that's about as bad as you can play in the second half of that hockey game. And a healthy Minnesota Wild team beats the Flames 5-2. to two. That That's... That, that's just how badly the Flames were playing. Um, now, credit to Jacob Markstrom, who, who stood on his head one more time. Um, but that was that was a concerning game to, to me from a Flames standpoint. And they're picking up wins. They've beat some good teams. People fancy them a playoff contender. That This team, we have talked about it ad nauseum. This team needs to sell. That This team needs to... I, I don't think they're going to blow this thing up. We've talked about it on Game Over a bunch. We've talked about it on here a, a bunch. We've talked about it on 960 a bunch. This team should blow it up. They're not going to blow it up. But any thoughts that this team is any type of legitimate contender to play anything more than five playoff games th this upcoming postseason, you are sadly mistaken. Like, they're, they're just not on that level. 
And I, I think last night was a perfect example of it where they can play really well for 20 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes, but they are not going to put that together for a full 60 minutes. They, they just do not have it in them. And good teams are going to crush that. So no, this is not... This is not the Calgary Flames team to go all in on. This is a Calgary Flames team that needs to go out and acquire draft capital and young assets and hope that they can hit like they have with Igor Sharangovich. On the upside, a couple of guys who are going to be around for a while. Jacob Markstrom and Jonathan Huberto each had really good games. Now, for Markstrom, that's kind of par for the course this season, and it is quite the turnaround from what was a disastrous season ago for him to get back to this point um, of being one of the, the top goaltenders in the National Hockey League is a huge bonus for Calgary, whether they want to move him or they want to, to build around him and Wolf as your tandem for forever. Um, th this is a, a real positive, I think, for Calgary. And for Huberto, you're not moving that contract. Ten and a half million dollars for forever. You you are, are simply not moving that deal. So you may as well make it work, right? Um, that's kind of what the, the Flames mentality should be. And it seems like they've got something. What with Sharon Govich and with Lindholm. Um, that goal Huberto scored last night. I mean, he had a wide open net. It was a good setup, but it was a confident drive to the net. That's what we're looking for right now as well. He looked really confident putting the puck into that open net. Um, but the play that I liked, and it was one where he passed, and I know we're frustrated about him passing, but he's driving in down the left wing side, and he's got kind of an, an open area to shoot at, and he doesn't. And for a while, that would be really frustrating. And if it was just like how Team Canada was doing at the World Juniors, where it's just a chip across, and a guy has to wildly flail at a one-timer, then yeah, that'd be frustrating. But he saw how Sharon Govich was situated, where he would, with a move, be able to get a really good opportunity with maybe the best shot on the team, and... So he hooks it around the defender and puts it right on the tape of Sharon Govich, who's able to make a move over to um, his stick side, I guess, his strong side. Uh, either way, make a move over to the side and shoot and get a really good opportunity out of it. That wasn't just a, for lack of a better term, huh, pass. That was a, a pass of confidence and a pass understanding, like, no, I know I could get this shot away, but that dude's shot is better, and I can put him in an advantageous situation. Those are the types of plays that you see when Jonathan Huberto was kind of back at his best. So, it, it's only a couple of games, but things have turned around for Huberto in a, a, a way that makes you feel pretty good about things. He's not going to end up on our next list, though. The NHL All-Stars, at least uh, some of them, will be announced tomorrow. As every team gets one representative, that representative will be made clear to us uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. But I thought today we'd take our, our shots at guessing who they're going to be. So here are the Couch Potato Diary NHL All-Stars uh, before tomorrow's official announcement. All right, really revolutionary stuff. We're going to list teams and list the best player on that team. Breaking the mold. Uh, but here we go. It is your NHL All-Star selections. Um, I'm going in order of how they appear in the standings as uh, I am recording this on January 3rd at 3.58 p.m. Mountain Time in the year of our hockey gods, 2024. Um, the Boston Bruins representative, you could pick a bunch of them, but it's Pasternak for me. He's in the top five in points. And... The, this Boston, I don't even want to say turnaround, because they were the best team in the NHL and one of the best regular season teams we've ever seen a season ago, but they lose out in catastrophic fashion in the postseason. They lose Krejci, they lose Bergeron, they replace them with nothing, and they still come out here and light the world on fire. Pasternak, a big reason for that. The New York Rangers are the second best team in the NHL, and their best player is Artemi Panarin, so he's our all-star pick. He just makes everything around him better. He has been such a huge pickup for the blue shirts out there in New York, and the star befitting of Broadway, for sure. But no, I've I've loved what I've seen from Panarin. Um, he is one of my favorite players, not on my favorite teams. I, I thoroughly enjoy watching this kid play. And he, like I said, he just makes everyone around him better. And he gets his points as well. And so he ends up on this. Uh, for Vancouver, they actually have a few you could pick from. Um, I ended up going with Quinn Hughes, the, the captain. He has been a breakout star and probably the Norris Trophy winner through the first close to half of this season. Um, he's doing it offensively. Defensively, you could absolutely pull Coles in his game, but there isn't a sound fundamentals defensively portion of the skills competition. 
Quinn Hughes is going to fit right in with the NHL All-Stars this year. Uh, with Colorado, it's Nathan McKinnon. I don't think I need to say, say more. One of the best players in the world? Yeah, let's bring him. Um, with the Winnipeg Jets, again, there's a couple you could pick from. Morrissey's having another strong year. Shifley, um, getting him away from Connor has actually worked out pretty well. But uh, to me, it's Connor Hellebuck. He, he is back to being one of the best goalies in the world and may end up winning or at least competing for a Vezina Trophy this year. Uh, Vezina right now is probably Demko or Ingram, but um, Hellebuck certainly deserves to be in the conversation. With Vegas, the defending Stanley Cup champions, uh, part of me wants to make it William Carlson just so we can see him absolutely obliterated again on national television, but I'm going to go with Jack Eichel instead. Uh, for Dallas, it, it's interesting because like, if you think like, okay, well, Dallas is one of the top teams in the league. Um, there's obviously like Robertson's having a big year and he's leading their team in points, but he has had a bit of a down year, I would say, uh, for, for his standards. I'm going to go Jake Ottinger, the, the goalie, helping them get to uh, this position right now. My cat is standing on my list. Oh, thank you. Um, so we're going to go a little bit further down and it is Matthew Kachuk. Uh, there she goes. Matthew Kachuk for the Florida Panthers. Uh, again, maybe not having the, the, the absolute Absolute scoring year that you would think. Uh, see, told you, cat, cat's right there. Um, not having the, the scoring season that that you would think you would have, but th this guy was the face of the NHL in the postseason last year. You, you want him on this big stage, so he he gets that spot. Um, for Carolina, it's Sebastian Aho. Again, you could pick a number of players, but real good team. He's the best player. Don't overthink this one. With the LA Kings, um, they haven't really had a, a super standout guy. Like obviously, like. Kopitar is going to stand out. Doughty has had a better year this year than I think people were anticipating he would have. I'm going to go a little bit off the board. I'm going to say Cam Talbot. I don't think this Kings team is in the spot they are without the play of Cam Talbot. And so he gets my nod for the LA Kings all-star selection. Uh, for the New York Islanders, it is Noah Dobson. This will make uh, fans of the team whose hat I'm wearing feel very upset as his pick was the one that was traded to the Islanders for uh, Travis Hamanick, who is not on the level of Noah Dobson and hasn't spent one day of Dobson's NHL career uh, being on his level. But the Flames did what the Flames did, and now Dobson for a while was leading this team in points. It's been a breakout year for him, and so I think he deserves this all-star nod. For the Leafs, they obviously have a lot of firepower, and they're probably going to be well represented at the all-star game they are hosting. Um, Matthews is obviously the big star. Marner um, has not maybe had a perfect year for his standards, but is, is a superstar as well. But this has to be William Nylander. Um, I think if they, they voted today, he would probably win the Hart Trophy. He has been that good for the Toronto Maple Leafs and kind of carrying them in what's been a bit of a frustrating year out in Toronto, again, by their standards. San Jose would kill to have that kind of frustration right now. But uh, William Nylander, contract year, he has been a beast, and he deserves to be an all-star for the first time. Uh, for Philadelphia, it's Konechny. He leads the team in goals and points. It's been quite the turnaround out in Philadelphia. You could maybe give it to Carter Hart. I would totally understand uh, why you would not want to, um, and so I'm not going to. I'm going to go with Travis Konechny, who has been the straw that stirs the drink out in Philly, but again, they're a team that has a few choices. Um, just for vibes alone, you could go Couturier. Owen Tippett is having another good season. You could recognize that, but Either way, um, I, I think it's Konechny. For Nashville, it is so obvious. Well, it's not so obvious. There's two you could pick. But Saros has kind of fallen, I don't want to say fallen off a bit, but just by his standards. He hasn't been the best goalie in the world this year. But it's Philip Forsberg. Watching the, the Preds game against the, the Flames and other Preds games this season, you just notice when he's on the ice. He is the straw that stirs the drink out in Nashville. Said that too much in this uh, segment. He is... He, he just makes so much of what Nashville does work. And um, it would be fun to see him on a team with maybe a bit more talent. Um, but he, he's been he's been great in maximizing what's around him. And so he gets the all-star nod. For Washington, maybe he doesn't deserve it because it hasn't been a perfect season. Uh, but it is Alexander Ovechkin. Um, <laughs> my cat comes walking in one more time. Um, like... This is absolutely a uh, Lifetime Achievement Award for Alex Ovechkin, but Alex Ovechkin, uh, I, I think, deserves to get this nod. Uh, for Tampa Bay, it's Nikita Kucherov, leads the world in scoring, so seems pretty easy for, for that one. Um, for the New Jersey Devils, it's Jack Hughes. Uh, Jack Hughes with another excellent year for the Devils. Um, they need to get the goalie situation figured out yesterday, but... Um, they, they, they got a good one out there in one of the Hughes boys for Arizona. They have a couple you could pick from. Um, I think a lot of people would have assumed, um, Cooley at the beginning of the year, but they are in a playoff spot right now. 
because of the play of Ingram. Um, and so, uh, hopefully no bad luck with the black cat walking by, but Ingram is the guy I think out in Arizona, um, having a, a real good year and probably should get some Vesna votes this season, uh, for Pittsburgh at Sidney Crosby. I don't think I need to tell you a whole lot more. Um, with the Detroit Red Wings, it's Alex Dabrinkit. Uh, an excellent, excellent start to the season. Has certainly cooled off, but is the top player right now for Detroit. Edmonton, McDavid, next. Um, Seattle, it's Vince Dunn. He leads, I think he leads their team in points. If not, he's right up there and leads in everything else. Um, they, they have had, uh, again, a coming back down to earth year there. But Vince Dunn might be having his best season. He has been so good. For Seattle this year. St. Louis, you would love to give it to Jordan Cairo just based off of, you know, the, the feel-good story that his own fans booed him after a head coach who he didn't get along with was fired, and he was still able to, like, bounce back from that and, and start to produce a little bit. Uh, but Thomas is from Toronto, and he has played quite well this season, and deserving of an all-star. This isn't just a hometown whatever. He has been everything St. Louis has asked of him. Uh, for Calgary, a about a month ago, this was going to be, can we send an equipment guy? Um, but it's it's Kadri. Um, the, the turnaround with, with Zari and Pospisil has brought Nazem Kadri back to the level that he expects to be at and that this organization expects him to be, that, uh, be at, and that is at an all-star level. And so I, I think he gets the nod here. Although you could certainly go Markstrom as well. Out in Montreal, it's Cole Caulfield. Um, they have played significantly better than a lot of people expected them to. I like a lot of what's building out there, and he's... He's a star on that team, so give him the all-star nod. For Minnesota, um, it is Kaprizov. He is hurt right now. If he can't go, then Boldy, uh, I think, has been the one to step up for Minnesota, but the pickings are slim out in Minnesota. It is Kaprizov. Mm, mm, mm. Boldy. So we'll, we'll see if, um, if Kaprizov can get healthy in time for the extravaganza out in Toronto. Uh, Rasmus Dahlin is our pick for, for Buffalo. Tage Thompson's been banged up a bit. Rasmus Dahlin, um, such an exciting player and helps drive a whole lot of what's happening in Buffalo. So he gets the, the all-star choice there. For Columbus, maybe this is me being bitter. I'm not going to send Johnny Gaudreau. We're certainly not sending Patrick Laine. I think you need to celebrate some of the youth with Columbus. And so I'm going with the third overall pick in this year's draft. Uh, I am going Adam Fantilli. He's the one who gets the, uh, the selection in Ottawa. You certainly could go Stutzla. That's probably where it ends behind our, our choice. It's Brady Kachuk, such a down season out in Ottawa, but Brady Kachuk, maybe he has focused a little bit too much on the aggression, um, uh, out in, uh, out with the senators, but I, I think he, he is at an all-star level and deserves to be there. Um, for Anaheim, not a lot to pick from. I'm going to go with McTavish. He's had the breakout season that a lot of people were anticipating. Again, a young player that you can celebrate and put on some posters out in Anaheim. In Chicago, this one is the easiest choice of all time. It is Connor Bedard. I don't even, like, it would be insulting to give an honorable mention. That's how much better Connor Bedard has been than every other one of his teammates. And lastly, the San Jose Sharks. The only player really worthy of this as well is Tomas Hurdle. So there you go. Spoiler alert. Those are going to be the all-stars tomorrow. Um, as I, I'm certain I went 32 for 32 on those picks. Uh, all right, let's close this one out today with a little bit of baseball talk. So Ross Atkins met with the Toronto media today, and the last time he did that was a disaster. Um, and this time was a disaster. And this one is at least, you can explain away. The other one, if the team hadn't already made a statement saying that they were committed to Ross Atkins, I would have fired him as soon as he stepped off the podium, throwing the the manager under the bus, um, just he he seemed to have zero grasp of what happened and what went wrong with this Blue Jays team. And um, that was it, it was quite concerning. But then they had the aggressive approach this offseason, going after Juan Soto, going after Shohei Otani and getting neither of them. And so people are expecting the Blue Jays to still be aggressive this offseason. But he came out today and he said, look, we, we've we've brought back Kiermaier. We have re-signed. New York Yankees, 82 and 80 cast off Isaiah Connor falefa We like the team we have. We think some internal growth is going to be enough to carry this team. And so there's a number of different ways you can go with this. One, the last part isn't entirely incorrect. We've said it before. This Blue Jays team 
is only going to go so far as Vladimir Guerrero takes them. You can add in, like, unless they would have got Soto or Shohei. Um, but even if you bring in Cody Ballinger or make a trade for Luis Robert, if Vlad Guerrero Jr. is still hitting 260 with 25 home runs, this is still a fringe wildcard team. If Vlad Guerrero Jr. is hovering around MVP categories one more time, uh, which has now opened up in the American League, um, then this is a team that can compete for a championship. It is unfair to put all that on one player, but it's all on one player. Th this team needs that big bat at the middle of the order to do its thing. Secondly, with the whole, we like our team. On the one hand, it would make zero sense for him to say anything else. Because he does have a, an entire team in his employ right now. Um, and so if he went out there and was like, look, I'm going to be real with you guys. We're fucked. You would be amazed at the level of fuckedness we are. That this is a disaster. I, I wake up every morning, look at our roster, vomit all over it and start our day. That would not be good for morale. Also, wouldn't be great when you're negotiating trades uh, or with free agents who all of a sudden, oh, well, that price went up. You need me or you need um, Alex Bregman or Nolan Arenado or whoever it is. You, you need to make this trade. So, yeah, from a position of strength standpoint, he's not going to go out there and be like, oh, boy, we need one of these teams to throw us uh, any kind of life jacket because we're screwed. On the other hand, if he, in his heart of hearts, truly believes that this team is fine and that they, they should be happy with what they have and rolling out a second and third base rotation of Espinal, Schneider, Biggio, and Kiner Falefa is enough to compete in the American League East, then the Blue Jays are actually fucked and you would be amazed at the level of fuckedness that they actually are. This roster is not good enough. Right now, they aren't close to Baltimore. Uh, they're certainly not as good as Houston. Um, they are not on the level of uh, Texas, uh, either and like the the Yankees I still think the Blue Jays pitching staff is a little bit better but the Yankees lineup w w just acquiring Juan Soto blows past Toronto so we've just listed four right there um and that's not even factoring uh Seattle who I, I think is probably wanting to take a step back but uh Seattle who is right there we all thought the Blue Jays were miles ahead of Minnesota and they kicked the shit out of the Jays last year so the point being like yes if you get best case scenario out of every guy on this roster you could win a championship Banking on that seems a little bit like whistling past the graveyard. So hopefully it was just uh, showmanship and not wanting to hurt morale and not actually the company line that the Blue Jays fans heard this week. Because if it is what th they actually believe, um, then the good news is you're going to have a different guy delivering the message next year. Uh, the bad news is that's going to mean this season sucks. And I, I think a lot of fans are really pissed at how things have gone. I think a lot of the goodwill that has built up over the last seven, eight years now, um, geez, nine years, uh, since 2015, where the, this that two decades of losing ended and this new era of being excited about the Blue Jays began, I think a lot of that goodwill is worn off. This team needs to, like, just golly gee, we got to play a couple of games in October on ESPN. That ain't enough. This team needs to make noise in the postseason or this fan base will revolt. And I've been around when that's happened before and it ain't fun. So hopefully this Blue Jays front office recognizes that and makes some moves to address that. That's going to do it for the show today. Uh, we're going to have a part two coming up in uh, a little bit as we are going to preview Wrestle Kingdom 18, which goes down in a few hours uh, from the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, Japan, with the main event of Sonata defending the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship against Tetsuya Naito. Uh, so part two is going to be coming up here in a little bit. As for tomorrow, we're going to have a Wrestle Kingdom recap, and we're going to talk about sports. Uh, nothing officially planned right now on Friday's show full NFL preview with all the different scenarios and, and everything like that. Um, and we're also going to do the best and worst of the year in professional wrestling, boxing, and mixed martial arts. Uh, and then coming up next week, we got some season review stuff. We got some fantasy uh, review things. We have some gambling review things. And we're getting ready for the NFL playoffs. So a lot to come on this channel. You're going to want to subscribe, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening in podcast form. If you are watching, leave a comment and like the video. And uh, if you're listening in podcast form, uh, leave a rating. That would be super 
Duper. You can find me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm at Primetime Klein, twitch.tv slash Primetime PK. And you can email this show, Couch Potato Diary, at yahoo.com. Thanks, y'all, for watching, and I will talk to all of you, hopefully, just in a few minutes.